Uh, Colossians chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, please stand out of respect for God's Word. Before we get started, I just want to give you a quick update on our buses. We had 66 on our buses today, so we were a little bit up from last week. Uh, Colossians chapter number 3, verses 1 through 4. The Bible says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank You for this, uh, this day. Lord, thank You for just the good church service we had this morning. Lord, right now I pray that You be with us tonight. I pray that You would just fill me and use me. I pray that You would be with everybody here tonight, that You would just open their hearts and they'd be ready to hear from You. And we ask all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Have you ever been driving along in your car or your bike and you started to focus on something other than the road? Maybe something stole your attention from the road. Maybe it was a brand new Mustang for all you Ford lovers. Or maybe it was an In-N-Out burger at lunchtime. Or maybe it was blue lights and sirens behind you. But it's probably a good possibility that all of these things stole your attention from where it should be and you started to focus on something else and you started to drift. You started to drift away. You may have drifted out of your lane into someone else's lane because your focus wasn't where it needed to be. I could remember when I was first learning to drive, I would hear often from my mom, pay attention! And I'd be like, what? And I'd be like, start on, and I'd yank the wheel back to where I need to go because I'd started focusing on something out in the distance, and no matter which way I was looking, I would always drift that way. So often my mom would yell at me to get my focus back where it needed to be, pay attention to the road. Paul, here in this passage, he's writing to the Colossians, and the Colossians had begun to drift away from Christ. And Paul was writing this letter to get their attention. They had lost focus on where it needed to be. They had drifted away, and their focus wasn't where it needed to be. The church at Colossae had become very worldly. Uh, they weren't living separated lives. If, if you were to take the members at Colossae and put them in a public area with regular sinners in the world, you probably wouldn't have been able to tell the difference. They struggled with the flesh. They struggled with sin. And it was still very appealing to the church at Colossae. Because the flesh is strong and it tries to pull us away from Christ. And it had done exactly this there at that church. I feel sometimes that this happens in our lives also. Maybe we get so busy we start to drift away from Christ. Maybe we give into our flesh and we enjoy it. Then decide to give into it a little bit more. And we gradually begin to drift away from God and we lose our focus on where it should be. In chapter 2, if you read towards the end of chapter 2, uh, false teachers had tried to get into the church and they tried to deceive the church at Colossae. They come in and try and tell them that they had to do some works if they were really to merit salvation. That being saved by grace alone was not enough. They were trying to give the Colossians all these rules and stuff that, that they had to follow to be saved. And rules without a relationship will not last. The false teachers were pushing rules, rules, rules when Christ said, I want a relationship. Christ doesn't want just simply rules. He wants a relationship with you. If you're thinking obeying rules and doing good works will get you to heaven, then friend, you're wrong. That's not what salvation is. And Paul here, he was trying to warn them. And he said, don't let these teachers and don't let these philosophers come in and try and deceive you because they're wrong. You don't need to listen to them. You see, the Colossians, they were trying to find uh, solutions for their problems here on earth. They were trying to search for the solution in people and here on earth. And many had drifted away and many others had believed these false teachers and they lost the focus on where it needed to be. They lost their focus off Christ. And that's when Paul comes in in chapter 3 and verses 1 through 4. And Paul says you need to look to heaven for the solution. He said the solutions for your problems, they can't be found here on earth and they can't be found in man himself, but rather they're found in heaven where Christ is. Nothing you can do in and of yourself will fix anything. It must be sought from above. So many things in this life will fight for our attention, and sometimes we may lose our focus at times. 
So tonight I want to share with you four truths that will help you get your focus on Christ. Uh, he says in verse 1, he says, If you then be risen with Christ, this obviously means if you're saved. If you're a born-again believer, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, he says, seek those things which are above. So if you want to get your focus on Christ, the first thing you need to do is seek those things which are above. To seek, it means to pursue or to follow after. It literally means to habitually set your mind and your attention on things above, not on the things of the earth. Wearsby said, he said, our feet must be on earth, but our minds must be set on heaven. We're supposed to be living here on earth, but we should have our minds set on heaven and on Christ. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So in Matthew, what was the first thing we were supposed to seek? The kingdom of God. He said, seek the kingdom of God first. Seek those things which heaven has the offer. What's in heaven? God. Jesus. Seek a relationship with Christ. Seek Him. So if you want your focus to be on Christ, the first thing you have to do is you have to seek Him. The second thing you have to do is you have to set your affections on things above. Paul here was saying, when he was saying set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth, he was saying you need to change your point of view. It's not right not right now. You need to change it from the things below to the things that are above. Because right now you're focusing on the things here on earth, then you're not, and you're losing your focus because you should be setting your affections on things above. It means... To, to set your affection on things above, it means to orient your will according to. It means to change your will to where it matches up with what you're supposed to be focusing on, and that's above. Heaven. You see, when our mind is on earthly things, sometimes we can actually hinder the work of God. You see, God, He has a, he has a plan and He has a purpose for your life, but if your mind is so focused on worldly things, then you can hinder what God has planned for you. You need to be focusing on on Christ. Uh, you see, the Colossians, they had set their affection on earthly things. So I'm going to tell you, what you're seeking after in this life and what you're setting your mind to will determine the direction of your life. This, I mean, this is serious stuff. So you better make sure that what you're seeking is above because if you're setting your affections and you're seeking the things on the earth, then you're going to be headed down a wrong path and that's not the path that Christ wants you to take. You see, everybody in this life, we're headed in a direction somewhere. We're all going somewhere. No matter where we're at. But some people are headed down a wrong road. Because they have lost focus on where it should be, which is Christ. Rather than looking to people, look to Christ. You, uh, get, uh, we all have struggles with sin in here. Get Christ help with your sin. It's much more liberating than trying to figure it out on your own power. Why keep living in that sin that you're living in? That sin that has such a stronghold on you. And I know deep down inside of you, when everybody has that besetting sin, deep down inside of you, you really want that sin gone, but sometimes you just seem like, I can't get rid of it. Focusing on Him will help. Focusing on Christ. You're always running back to that sin, and you seem like no matter what you do, that you're going to keep running back to it. Instead of focusing on that sin, focus on Christ, because He's the one who can help you with that sin. Focus on Him. We, we have that besetting sin and we, it goes a little bit like this. We commit that sin. We know we've done wrong. And so we go to God and we ask for forgiveness. And He forgives us because He's a forgiving God. He doesn't have to, but He chooses to. He chooses to forgive us. And so we sin. We ask for forgiveness. God forgives us. We get right and we think everything's great. And then we sin again. And, like, and then you feel terrible. And so then, then you pray and you ask God for forgiveness again for that same sin that you keep falling into. So you pray again. You ask for forgiveness. God forgives you because He's long-suffering and He wants to forgive you because He loves you. And then you get right and you think everything's fine and then you sin again. And it's an ongoing chain of sinning and asking for forgiveness and getting forgiveness and getting right and then falling into that sin again. And it's ongoing and ongoing because our focus isn't on Christ. You have to focus on Him. If happiness is based on earth, then you're going to live a miserable life. You can't seek your happiness in a person or individual, but rather seek your joy and happiness in Christ. Because He's the real center of joy. You can't find happiness in a person, but you can find it in Christ. Because He's the real source of happiness and joy. You have to If you want to have a relationship with Christ and get the joy with Him, then you actually have to have a relationship with Him. Get, have a real relationship with God. Don't seek in a person what only Christ can give. Don't seek in a person what only Christ can give. 
So why is Paul saying all this? Why is he saying, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God? Why is he saying, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth? Paul is saying you ought to look to heaven because Christ is there. You ought to look to heaven because Christ is there. Because Christ, He's the central focus of heaven. As we, as we speak right now, Christ, He's being worshipped in heaven. Angels are bowing down before Him and they're crying, Holy, Holy, Holy. And they're continually saying, Holy, Holy, Holy. And they're worshipping God. Why should that be any different in our lives? Why should Christ not be the center of our lives? Why are we not focusing on Christ? Why are we bowing down and saying, Holy God, You are holy. You are holy. You are holy. You are worthy to be praised. Why are we not doing that? Christ has to be the center focus of our lives. But oftentimes He's not. Too often the center of our lives is a cell phone. Too often the center of our lives is Facebook. Too often the center of our lives is a television. Too often the center of our lives is a sport. Too often the center of our lives is a job. And that becomes our focus, and that becomes our drive, and that becomes a motivation, and we lose our focus off Christ when that's where our focus should be, on Jesus Christ. So the second point was, set your affections on things above. My third point is, seek Him. He is worthy, plus you're dead. You're like, uh, I'm dead? Uh, no, I'm pretty sure I'm alive. What's that mean? You're dead to the things of this world. It means you're not responsive. You don't have to respond to the things that the world's going to send your way. I was reading in Warren Wiersbe's commentary, I was studying for this sermon, and he tells the story of two young girls, and they were actually sisters. And these sisters, they used to attend wild parties. They really enjoyed dancing. They enjoyed getting drunk and doing all these parties. But they got saved. And they, they experienced a change in their life, and they found new life in Christ. And they received an invitation to a party with an RSVP, and they said these words. We said, we regret that we cannot attend because we recently died. They were dead to those things. They didn't have to respond to those invitations any longer. You see, this world is going to send some invitations your way. I'm almost positive everyone in this room knows that already. Many of you have responded to those invitations. Some of you will respond to them. Some of you haven't responded, and we praise the Lord for that. But just remember that just because the world sends an invitation your way doesn't mean you have to respond. The world's going to invite you to say, hey, why don't you come over here and why don't you drink a beer and just have a good old time and show you a bunch of people on TV having a great time and celebrating and having a wonderful time. But they're not going to show you the dad coming home who's beating his wife and beating his kids. They're not going to show you that, but they're going to send you an invitation anyways because it looks nice and it'll be fun. The world's going to send that kind of invitation to you and try and destroy your family. Hey husband, hey father, hey son, the world's going to send you an invitation to look at pornography. It's going to say, after all, it's just a photo. It doesn't mean anything. I mean, it's not actually like you're cheating on your wife. It's not, but really, they're not going to show you the broken homes it's created. It's not going to show you the divorce it's created. It's not going to show you the, the man's life who's been ruined, but it's still going to send you that invitation. It's going to be appetizing. It's going to look good. And they're going to send you that invitation. But you're dead to it. You don't have to respond. Hey, wife. Hey, mom. The world's going to send you an invitation to flirt with that coworker who understands what you're going through and can't believe your husband would ever treat you that way. He's going to send you that kind of invitation. And the world is going to send you an invitation that says, enjoy me now, pay later. Because you can... You can have that pleasure for a season, but you're going to have to pay for it later. It's going to ruin your life is what it's going to do. I mean, we've all had our failures in this room. I've had my failures. We all have our regrets. But you have to put your past behind you and focus on Christ. You have to get your focus back on Christ because you're dead to all of those things. You don't have to answer to Him anymore. You're dead to Him. Once you were dead in sin, now you're dead to sin. That's because you're saved and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You don't have to respond anymore. Romans 6, 2 says, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer than they're in? It's like we're dead to it. We don't have to live in this any longer. That's an awesome feeling. We're dead and we're alive at the same time. Dead to sin, but alive to Christ. We're dead to sin, but alive to Christ. Someone once said that life is what you are alive to. Life is what you're alive to. 
A little child may light up when you say, hey, we're going to a baseball game. Or I got an ice cream cone for you. A child may light up when he hears that. A teenager may light up when, when a parent says, hey, we're going to go look at some cars and we might buy you one. These things might light you up. But Paul said, for me to live is Christ. Christ was Paul's life, and he was alive to anything that was related to Christ. That was Paul's center of his life. That was his joy, serving Christ and having a relationship with him. It should be the same for us because we're dead to sin, and we should be alive to anything that relates to our Lord Jesus Christ. We should be alive to the things of God. If you're seeking the things above, the things people say on earth and criticize you really don't matter because you're seeking Christ. People criticizing you for serving God, coming to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and giving you a hard time for it, that doesn't matter because you're seeking Christ. That's all that matters. Your relationship with Him matters. Do you think Paul really cared if people talked junk about him regarding him serving the Lord? Do you think it bothered him when they poked fun of him? No way. No way. Paul was concerned about what was above and making sure that his life brought glory to God. That's what Paul was concerned about. So to get your focus on Christ, you have to realize that you're dead. Dead to those things. Not only are you dead to sin, but that brings me to my fourth point. Your life is hid with Christ. Verse 3 says, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Well, what, well, what does that mean? To hide, it means to conceal. Your, your life is concealed, or rather, it's, it's safe in Christ. So why do you hide something? Because it's valuable. Uh, have you ever hidden something from yourselves? I had to stop hiding things because I would hide them from myself, and they were important, and they were valuable, but when I hid them, I couldn't find them because I forgot where I hid them. But luckily with Christ, He doesn't forget that you're hidden in Him. He's always going to protect you. You see, life, it's valuable to God. The only reason that you're living and breathing today is because of God. Life is like an invaluable jewel. It's precious. But since you're hid in Christ, you're safe in Christ, and that means you're hid from the devil. You see, Satan can't, he can't find you. When you get saved, you become sealed, and you don't ever, ever, ever have to worry about losing your salvation because you're safe in Christ and you're hid in Christ. So why was Paul saying all of this? Paul, he admonished the Colossian believers to set their affections on things above because that would determine the direction of their lives. So today... If you want to apply it, the Christian must set their affections toward Christ because He will lead them in the right direction. If you set your affections on Christ, then He will lead and guide your life. And He'll lead it in the right direction. But the direction we are heading may not always be the direction, though. Right direction. Sometimes we're not following Christ and we've lost focus on where it needs to be. So is there a relationship that you're following that's more important to you than Christ? Is it money or maybe a job that's more important to you than Christ? Maybe it's a sport that's more important to you than Christ. Maybe you can't focus on Christ because of that certain sin that just controls your life and has such a stronghold on you that you can't get rid of it. And it's making you lose your focus on Christ. Get this. Once you set your mind on Him, things will begin to change. Once you set your mind on Christ, things will begin to change in, that, in your life. I can promise you that. But you have to get in His Word. You have to read, your, read His Bible. You have to spend time in prayer. You have to talk to God. You have to have a real relationship with Him. If you're communicating with God, communication works both ways. If you're only ever reading your Bible and not praying, then God's only speaking to you, but you're never speaking to Him. And it's the same way. If you're only praying and never reading your Bible, then you're only talking to Him and you're never letting Him talk to you. It's a two-way street. Like if I only ever spoke to my wife and never let her speak to me, we probably wouldn't have a good relationship. Or if I only let her speak to me and I never spoke to her, then we probably wouldn't have a good relationship. It's the same way with God. You have to be talking to God and you have to let Him be talking to you to have a real relationship with Him. You have to be talking to God. And once you set your mind on Christ, you can get rid of that sin that's in your life. He can, he can get rid of it. But, but for sin in our lives, if we have it, we have to mortify it. Because he says in verse 5, he says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And then he lists all these things. Mortify means to kill. You have to kill it. Uh, don't put it in a cage and keep it. Because if you put it in a cage, you can take it out and play with it whenever you want. But rather, sin has to be killed so it doesn't affect us anymore. You have to get it out of your life. I know so many of us here tonight are probably not so heavenly minded. 
but rather a lot of us are quite the opposite, maybe a little worldly minded. So why are so many Christians not heavenly minded? Why is their focus not on Christ? Why did Paul admonish the Colossians to set their affections on things above? It's because your affections can be set on things below. You can set your affections on things below. You see, there is a God of this world that has blinded the eyes of man. Many Christians forget that they're actually dead to sin, and they are hid in Christ, and they forget that they're dead to these things, but rather they become alive to them. They're alive to the things of the world. From observing the world today in this generation, I, I think many Christians are alive to this world when they should be dead to it. I'm not talking about just young people. I'm talking about everybody. All ages. It's not just the teenagers. People have become alive to the world's music. They're alive to the greed and the gain of this world. It's all about being rich and getting more and more and more, and it's never enough. They become alive to it. The youth, they're alive to the passions of the world. And many Christians are more concerned about their status among people than they are about their relationship with God. Their status in the community, they're more important about that than having their relationship with God. Many Christians, they've become alive to the movies of this world. And they watch movies that are filled with immorality, with drugs, and pregnancy outside of marriage. And it's just become something that's funny that we can laugh at. And we've become dead and we've become insensitive to it. It's just something to laugh at now. And because of this, many of the younger generation have become dull to the wickedness and seriousness of sin and dull towards the things of God. Language that you used to use doesn't bother you anymore. The jokes that you used to be ashamed of don't bother you anymore. Remember that you bear the name of Christ. And what you're seeking after will determine where you go, and it could lead you to destruction. Very well could lead you to destruction. Ray Comfort, he tells a story. We definitely don't agree with everything he says, but I like his story. He tells the story of he, he bought a TV for his family, and he put it in the living room. And the day after he bought it, he got home. He came home from work, and when he would come home from work, he was used to children greeting him at the door wrapping their legs around because they were so excited to see dad come home. But today was a little bit different. Nobody was there to greet him. And he walked into the living room to find all of his children glued to the TV, unawares that he was even there. He simply walked up to the TV. He turned it off and he said, if you're going to enjoy the gift more than the giver, then the TV's got to go. And I believe that's what's happened in our and Christianity today. We've enjoyed the gifts that God has given us more than the giver. We've enjoyed the gift more than the giver, and we're all guilty of it. We've enjoyed God's blessings so much in our life that we've forgotten to enjoy God. We've enjoyed the gift more than the giver. So I say tonight is a good night to start setting our affections on things above. We need to get our minds off earthly things and start focusing on what's above, and that's Christ. So what's going on in your mind during the day? What consumes your thoughts? What are you thinking about? Are you thinking about Christ, or are you thinking about earthly things? Who or what has your affection? Does Christ have your affection? Or does something else have it? Set your affections on things above, not below. You will not be truly unhappy till you do this, and it will save you a lot of heartache. You can finally get joy when you set your affections on things above. You can finally get happiness when you set your affections on Christ. So to wrap it all up, if you're saved, seek those things which are above and set your affections on things above. Take your affections off worldly things because you're dead to them. You're dead to them and you're alive to Christ and you're safe in Him. You're hid in Him, and you're never going to lose your salvation, and you're safe in Christ. And one day, in verse 4, we're going to appear with Him in glory, and He's going to come back in all His glory. Verse 4 says, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with Him in glory. See, that's exciting. It's exciting that we're going to get to appear with Him. The first time He came in grace, the second time He's coming in all His glory. First time he came in, the first time He came to redeem, this time He's coming back to reign. That's exciting that we're going to get to reign with Christ. But that day has not come yet. But it is. 
It is coming. And in the meantime, Christ is our life. In the meantime. I want to point that phrase out to you. It says, who is our life? You see, Christ is our life. He should be the center of our lives. He should be primary in our lives. He should be the reason we do what we do. He is the reason we get to wake up every morning. And when we wake up every morning, we should live each day for Him. Because He's given to us. And everything you do, do it all to the glory of God. Everything in your life, you have to do it for the glory of God. So if you've lost focus, then tonight it's a, it's a good night to get it back where it needs to be. Back on Christ. We need to set our affections on things above, not on things to lo- below. So maybe tonight would be a good night for you to come to an altar and tell God, my focus hasn't been where it needs to be. Maybe some things and you need to confess to God that they've stolen your attention away from Him. And that you need to get your focus back on Him. And have that relationship with Him. Because like I said, the world is going to send you invitations. It's going to try and steal you away from Him. But you don't have to respond to Him. You're dead to Him. Just focus on your relationship with Christ. And in everything you do in your life, make sure it's for Christ. Don't live for yourself. Don't live for the things of this world. Because when all that's said and done with when your life is over, those things really don't matter. It's the things you do for heaven's sake. Your relationship with God will matter.